Well, good morning. I know you got more in you than that. Good morning. <laughs> so good to be here with you guys. Uh, great to see you guys, both of you, you guys who are here in person and those who are joining us online. Uh, really good to be able to worship with you guys and grow with you today. I want to begin by posing a question for you to think about today. Um, have you ever been in a spot where you worked really, really hard at something, but it didn't really pan out well for you? Like you worked really hard, but it didn't really result in much fruit for you. I, I think of this in many instances in my own life where I worked real hard at something like my middle school years. You can see here, I was trying really hard to be really cool. Actually, this is even pre-middle school. I was trying to be cool. But you know what? Somebody pointed out to me today that these are like the Harry Potter glasses. So I'm about to be back in style here really soon. But uh, you can see on this next photo too, like I was a lady killer. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, <laughs> this was a situation where I was definitely trying, trying really hard with my really cool baggy cargo pants. To, uh, to be able to fit in, it was not working out so well for me. But there's other times in our lives where we actually do work really hard at something and it actually results in something really good for us. And so I think of my wife and her journey with running. She had never all the way through high school, even all the way through college, had wanted to be a runner, but had never actually ran a full mile. She had tried the walk run thing and I don't know if it was a mental hurdle or something that she got past in her late 20s, but she got to a place where um, she could run a mile. And then she kept working up, got to two miles. You can see a photo here of us. Uh, we ran a 5K uh, with some family and friends. And uh, even now that, well, I can't say her age, but I'm in my mid thirties. <laughs> uh, even now she can get out of bed and run four miles, no problem. And, uh, and so she had to work really hard to get to that spot. But now she, it's something she really enjoys. It's a stress release when she needs to get away from me um, or uh, even just the physical benefits that come from running. It is really worth it. And so the, the question for us today that we're going to wrestle through is, is following Jesus really worth it if it's really hard? Like, is it, is it actually worth it? Because I think about in my own life, I've had experiences, and maybe you can identify with this as well if you uh, consider yourself a follower of Jesus, where um, I've had interactions with people where it, either overtly or usually it's covertly, it felt like they thought I was intellectually inferior because I believed in some ancient thing from 2,000 years ago, like some guy who rose from the dead. Like it's, it's kind of a ridiculous thought is, is kind of the way I felt like I was treated. And uh, there's, there's other times where um, I've felt like maybe I was criticized or looked down upon for uh, even things that I did not choose to do. So maybe um, even for you, it's, it's things like um, not partaking in excess drinking or uh, substances that can alter your mind. Or uh, maybe it's saying like, I'm going to be committed to my partner forever. Like that's that's my commitment instead of just saying like, I'm just going to find whoever can make me happy whenever it's a whole different mindset. And so sometimes that can be hard when you're following Jesus for the things that you choose not to do. And sometimes it's, uh, can be challenging to follow after Jesus for the things that you do choose to do. So it could be things like, uh, choosing to use your hard earned resources to give back to others. Uh, it could be things like saying, I'm going to use my Sunday morning to go and serve others. I'm going to even change little babies' diapers, <laughs> even though uh, that doesn't sound like the most fun thing in the world. It's my way to serve others instead of going out to Sunday brunch and mentally preparing all day long for the Bills game would be another option that you could do. I I'd be remiss if I didn't just say here. Go Bills. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but honestly, it can, it can be hard for us as followers of Jesus. Even sometimes the hardest thing for me isn't even the things that I do or I don't do that I sacrifice or whatever. For me, sometimes the hardest part of being a follower of Jesus is actually other Christians who I can be like, mm, man, I really do not want to be associated with you right now. 
Like the way that you're talking about those people over there who, again, maybe they don't even follow after Jesus, but there's all sorts of judgmental tone for how they're living their life, those people. And I just, I get, it gets a little cringy for me sometimes when I hear um, some other Christians talk. Of course, nobody in this room, but those other Christians out there. Do you ever feel like, honestly, it's just really hard to follow after Jesus, to follow in his ways? Like, are there times for you where you're like, you know what? I think it would just be easier if I just phoned it in and just kind of blended in with everybody else. I know I've felt that way, and maybe you have as well. But I believe that God actually has a better way for us. And so That's the conversation that we're going to have today. And to do so, we're going to open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 25. And we're going to go to a conversation with Jesus directly on this. You can uh, read along on the screen or on your Bibles if you have one with you. Once, when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, Jesus asked? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone, and he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? You see, the most important question you can ever ask in your entire life is, who is Jesus? It's the question he asks right here. Who do you say Jesus is? He says, who do you say I am? And first he asks, what do the crowds, what does everybody, what do they say that I'm like? And the thing of it is, is that um, many people have many different answers within our culture as to who is Jesus. You know, outside of followers of Christ, a common sentiment in most world religions would say that they believe the things that Jesus said were good things. Things like pursuit of peace and love your neighbor. There's like, there's good things that he said. And so the problem most people have is not with what Jesus said. The problem is who he said he was. And, you know, the, the, the question here is personalized when it gets to Peter. And I believe it's personalized for us. He says, Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter says, I believe you are God's Messiah. You are God come down in the flesh. 100% man, 100% God come to save and to rescue us. But that's not how everybody answers that question. And, you know... Uh, there's, there's this very common sentiment within our culture that just says that, you know, hey, whatever you want to believe, like, that's good for you. Like, if it, if it brings you happiness, like, you just do that. And, um, and, and it kind of goes along with the sentiment of just kind of like, hey, whatever your path is that you want to get to God, just do that. As long as it makes you happy, then it's good. And the problem with this is, is when we get to the words of Jesus, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And and the thing that that he is saying here is that he is the Messiah. And the, the thing about this claim from Jesus is either Jesus was the Messiah or he was not. Like, you can't have it both ways. And I understand we live in like a postmodern, post truth world, but like, can we just take a minute to apply this logic and say, like, you either are the Son of God or you are not? You, you either are or you're out of your mind. If you make the claim that you are the Son of God today, like, you go make that claim, you're probably gonna end up in a mental institute. 
because you need help. So there, there's, there's, there's only one of two options. We can't just say like, oh, Jesus was a good person and a good prophet, which is the major sentiment in our world today. And so the question for you to ask is not what did Jesus say, not just that, was it good teachings, but who did Jesus say he was and who is Jesus to you? Because if he is the son of God, then we need to pay attention to what he says. And the thing of it is, Paul actually writes, uh, who wrote two thirds of the New Testament around there. He says um, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, like, if this didn't happen, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our preaching is useless and so is our faith. In other words, all of this, all the things that we're doing here is all a bunch of garbage. Like we should pack up and go home if Jesus did not raise from the dead, if he was not who he said he was. And so for us today, this is the most important question we can ever ask is who is Jesus? Now, I want to keep breaking down this passage for you and we'll get to see a little bit more of who Jesus is. And maybe even if he's a God worth following, if he's claiming that he is God himself. And here's what it says in verse 22. I'll read it again. He said, and he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, uh, my family recently got struck by COVID and uh, Thankfully, it was uh, nothing uh, horrible, but we, we ended up, it, it went from my daughter, then six days later to my son, then like eight days later to me. So we had somebody in quarantine for like 23 days, and um, it just felt like forever for us. And uh, um, every, everybody's healthy and recovered now, but um, as I was going through it, it knocked me out pretty good for, for three days. I couldn't get out of bed um, for like a week. I, it felt like I was swallowing glass, um, which apparently is a side effect of Omicron or something like that. I don't know, but it hurt like the Dickens. I mean, it was, it was definitely painful. And, um, yeah, and, and honestly, my, my poor wife, she had to keep everything afloat for that whole time, canceled all of our holiday plans and things like that. And the truth of it is that like the, the bout I had with COVID was painful. I don't know that I'd even call it suffering, but many of you here today have gone through actual real suffering in your life. Like there's been actual real deep pain and deep loss that you have gone through. Tears have soaked your pillow on many a night. And the thing of it is, is that the, the person of who Jesus is, is he didn't just involuntarily get a, a virus like I did. He voluntarily went to the cross for you and for me to die the death that we deserved so that we could be free. And what I can tell you about God is that God can actually identify with your pain that you are going through as you go through it. Not only can he identify that uh, with that pain with you, he actually is a God who cares with you, cares for you as you go through it. It's not even that he just went through it one time, a really painful death. He actually walks with you as you go through your pain and through your suffering. And that's the beautiful thing about following after Jesus is that following Jesus means following someone who suffered painfully, a God who loves you deeply as well, even as you go through your own pain. I love this passage um, in, in Psalm 34, 18. It's one of my very favorite verses in all of scripture. It says, God is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. You see, as you're going through your own brokenheartedness, your own hurt, your own pain, your own struggle, that's the moment where God is moving closer and closer to you. God loves you so, so much. How many of you are grateful this morning for the love of God that does not leave you alone? If you believe it, would you say amen? Amen. So following Jesus starts with us 
uh, identifying who is he and answering that question. And then we recognize the character of who God is, that he's a God who walks with us through our pain, that he actually suffered on our behalf. But I want to break down these next two verses as well, because they're super important for us this morning. It says this, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. So how are we saved? We are saved, it says here, by the giving away of ourselves, by the trusting in Jesus, in who he is. And here's what's so unique about Jesus is that the other gods of this world are all about what you can do to earn your approval for them. But you and I, we are approved by what Jesus did for us. It's the total flip and opposite. It's not about what you can do. It's about what he has already done for you on your behalf. And the thing of it is, is that you and I recognize that we are not perfect, that we don't measure up. But the beautiful news about Jesus is that we are not saved by the perfection of our faith. We are saved by the object of our faith. His name is Jesus. It's another good place to say amen. Amen. And so church, I want us to recognize that Every single one of us chooses what we are going to put our trust in. Like we can put it in our jobs. We can put it in our family. We can put it in our, yeah, our spouse, our kids. Our, like there's so many different places we can end up trying to put our trust in in this world. And again, the message is that the, the place that you can find true joy, peace, and happiness is by just looking inside at who you are. It's in there. And, you know, I think we've got to kind of pause and, and reflect and just ask how that's working out for our culture, because anxiety continues to rise. Depression continues to arise. Suicide rates tragically continue to arise. Loneliness continues to be at an all time high. So we have to ask this question, is this vantage point working? I recently heard a message by a pastor. His name is Glenn Packiam, and he says this. Our age has been called the age of anxiety. I don't mean the mental health stuff. I mean the deeper gnawing sense in our souls. The inner part that just says, I don't know. We thought it was liberating to say to a person, take the pen of your own story and write your own script. We thought it was freeing to say to an individual, you can determine your own identity and value system. We thought it was liberation. It turned out to be oppression. We thought it was freedom. It turned out to be a prison. You see, Jesus has come back and he has come for your actual freedom. He has come for your soul to rescue you. And the thing about your soul, it's the deeper most part of who you are, of, of what you believe, of how you act, of how you behave. It's, it's everything inside of you. It's more real than the skin and the flesh and the bones that you and I see each and every day. And if you are looking for your soul to be free, it isn't just found by looking inside. You see, the problem is we, we, we recognize this. The problem isn't just always out there with those people. We recognize the problem's also in here. So we can't just look inside. Instead, we have to recognize you and I, we are made clean by the blood, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it's when we realize this, when we can actually put our faith and our trust in him, that's when we can actually realize that we are saved, that we are forgiven. And that's what leads to actual freedom in our hearts and in our lives. Following Jesus is worth it for you and for me because it preserves our soul forever and ever in the hands of a loving Savior. And while following Jesus is always good for your soul, I, I must tell you that it is not always easier. You see, uh, th this passage we just read said, you're going to have to pick up your cross and follow me. Picking up a cross is not easy. It's big, it's clunky, it's heavy, it's got splinters on it. You're going to get poked. 
You're going to get hurt along the way. And, and here's the thing. Growing up, I was uh, sold this message. I don't know if it was like I received it wrong or it was said wrong to me. I don't know where, where the message went wrong. But, but I was told this message that like if you follow after Jesus, like it's going to get better for you. Like it's, it's going to be, your, your, your marriage is going to be blessed. Your faith is going to be blessed. Your, your kids are going to do so much better because they're going to be following after God's ways. So they're going to behave better. That hasn't always worked out for us. And, you know, it's like we, we think that following after Jesus is going to make things better. But then we, we recognize this when we start living out our faith and living out our lives. It's like, well, sometimes it's better, but sometimes it's actually just harder. Like, it can be a real challenge to actually follow after Jesus. Sometimes for us, like, it, it is really challenging. Like, like, when your mom passed away too young, or when your kids are struggling to make friends, or when your job is just a drag every single day, and so you're grateful for the provision, but man, it is hard to get out of bed. And we thought that following after Jesus was going to bring meaning and purpose and life to all of these things, but then it doesn't play out that way. And here's the thing. I know that you recognize this cognitively, that, that this is how it's played out for you. The, the problem exists in that what, what happens is we actually think, okay, I thought life was going to keep getting better with Jesus. It's now not. And instead of saying like, maybe I just have some mistaken theology. Maybe I haven't like applied God's word correctly to my life. Instead, what we do is we end up throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And by the baby, I mean, we say goodbye to Jesus because we say my experience is not lining up with what I've been taught. So maybe this all is not correct. So there's a lot at stake when we don't apply God's word correctly or true or have it full in our lives. And this is why I think it's important for us to actually recognize there's a dichotomy at play for us as followers of Jesus. And the dichotomy is this, is that following Jesus ushers you into a life that is simultaneously the most joyful and the most difficult on earth. It's both and. You see, Jesus didn't come so that your life would just be easy. In fact, oftentimes the best things in our lives are made through sacrifice, are made through going through hardships. And Jesus said this very clearly to you and to me. In this life, you are going to have troubles. You are going to have problems. You saying yes to Jesus doesn't just make your life easier. But he says, but take heart for I have overcome the world. And here's the thing, for you and me, who are, for, for you, if you are a follower of Jesus, we have a long range view of what is the good life, of what is the full life. And Jesus came that you may have life to the full and not just for eternity, but for today. And what I want you to know is that following Jesus is going to be hard for you. If you actually apply it to your life, it's going to be challenging, but it is worth it because it is what actually leads to the good and true and full life. And there are going to be times for you where you are tempted to give in to this American culture and to the values that it espouses. But for you, I want to invite you to instead to stay true to the promises of God, to stay true to the biblical values that you can instill into your heart and into your life. We as a church are not perfect, but we are committed to following after Jesus, regardless of how challenging it may be, regardless of what happens out there. We are going to say yes to Jesus. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. I'm going to invite you to bow your head this morning. I want to give you a moment to be able to reflect today, to be able to, to think. And um, I've got two different things for you to think about. The first is if you have never uh, decided whether Jesus was the Messiah or not, I just want you to know first off that you are welcome here, that uh, this is a, a place for you to explore your faith. And my, my first comment I'd want to make to you if you're in that space, I've been there myself, is just I would encourage you to stay intellectually and spiritually curious. 
continue to ask, who is Jesus and what is he like? And for us as a church, um, we, we want to help you with, with you on that journey. And so um, any of us are available for conversations around that. And um, in fact, we even have a book we would love to be able to bless you with. It's a book called Jesus Is by Judas Smith, um, which, which helps answer some of the questions about God. Very accessible book. Um, an easy read. And so um, if that's something you would be interested in, we, we'd love to bless you with that at the Welcome Center. But, but the most important thing I want for you to think about, if you are wrestling through this question of who is Jesus, is for you to just have a conversation with him about that. Who do you say he is? You see, the earliest disciples answered this question and they answered it with their lives. With the exception of Judas, all of Jesus' closest friends, followers, disciples gave up their life for him because they believed. That was a picking up of their cross and following after him. But for the rest of you, maybe you have decided to say yes to Jesus already. What for you is really hard about following after Jesus? Is it for you, is it temptation? Is it compromise? Is it sacrifice? And here's the thing. The truth is, is that you just like trying harder on your own can get you like incrementally a little bit better, but it's not actually going to transform your heart. But if you actually choose today to fall more in love with Jesus, than, than the things that are hard about following after him, he can begin to actually change and transform your heart. He's an actual living God who works inside of our souls. And he wants to do that for you today. You've got a God who is right beside you in the midst of your own struggle, of your own hardship. He is near to you right now. He's inviting you to put your trust in him. So would you trust him? He is more beautiful than anything you could ever imagine. He is the rescuer of your soul. He walks with you no matter what you go through. So let me just allow you for a moment to be able to talk to him directly, either about who Jesus is or about what it is that you are struggling with right now. He wants to hear from you. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are and for what it is that you have done for us. Amen. Would you stand, church, this morning and respond in worship? We're going to sing a song. It's through the highs and the lows, no matter what we go through, we say yes, we believe in you, Jesus. Would you sing this out, church? <laughs> 